Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Core Conversations, the ACTC conversation series. Uh, we started this series uh, during the pandemic as a kind of a concession uh, to the distances that had to be created between us, but we've kept it going because it's uh, such a nice thing to be able to talk to each other uh, in this way, even though we also uh, now can travel to each other some and, and we do that as well. I'm Charlie Thomas. Uh, I am the executive director of ACTC and I'm joined here today by Michael McShane. I'm so glad you're here, Michael. Hello, I'm uh, glad to be here myself. I'm a big fan of ACTC and the work that you're doing there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, we're, we're doing our best. Uh, so this is the first, um, of our 2022-2023 core conversation series. Um, uh, and the way the series works is we have a recorded session, like the one that you're viewing right now, followed by a live conversation on Zoom. Uh, you've found us, so you've either found this link on our YouTube channel or on our uh, website. Um, and the link to the Zoom uh, room that we use for these conversations uh, is available in both of those places as well. So I trust you can find it. Uh, the live conversation uh, that follows this recorded session will be September 9th, uh, 2022 at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, as, uh, as ACTC is an international organization, um, it is very important that I uh, emphasize and repeat Eastern time. But 10 a.m. Eastern time, uh, Michael will get back on here with me. Uh, but in a context where we'd love you for you to join us for an hour of conversation. Um, we have a great series this academic year that Michael's kicking off. Um, October 14th will be our live session with Christine Dunn Henderson. Um, she'll, her, her talk will be on Tocqueville. Um, and then we'll have that opportunity to talk with her on October 14th. Um, November 11th, uh, we'll have a conversation with Kevin Honeycutt on Machiavelli. I should say Christine is at Singapore Management University. Kevin is at Mercer University. He's my colleague here at Mercer. Um, January 20th, so at the beginning of uh, the new year, um, Alex Priyu um, of the Herbst program at the University of Colorado Boulder will join us to talk about Plato. February 10th, Jose Taralba of the University of Navarre um, will join us to talk about uh, Ortega Gasset. And finally, our sixth and final core conversation for this academic year will be March 3rd with Michelle Rosga of Nor Norfolk State University on James Baldwin. So it's an it's a, it's a exciting series, uh, both in terms of the authors that we're engaging and the great people um, who have agreed to, uh, to do core conversations with us. Again, in all, case, all of these cases, you'll find on our YouTube channel, the recorded portion of the core conversation, and you're invited to join us on Zoom uh, for, for the live portion. This is our third year of core conversations, so there's, there's quite a nice library um, available on the YouTube channel. I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, but now it's time for me to turn things over uh, to Michael, I'm going to ask him uh, to introduce himself, uh, and uh, and then uh, and then to tell us um, uh, his thoughts. His the author he's chosen to talk about today is is Dante, and so uh, maybe Michael, you can do the introduction and then just uh, go right into your remarks on Dante, if that's okay. Right. Thank you, um, and thanks again for the invitation. Um, my name is Michael McShane. I am the Director of Public Humanities at the Dallas Institute for Humanities and Culture in Dallas, Texas. Uh, uh, before I became that, I spent 20 years teaching and thinking about great books in philosophy and literature. And before that, I was uh, educated to get to the level of a PhD in ancient Greek philosophy, MA in comparative literature, BA in whatever St. John's College gives BAs in, which I don't know, but it was a terrific experience. Uh, and so today I'm here to present a short paper I wrote entitled Dante's Infernal Pedagogy, Lessons in Close Reading. So uh, I will present a series of 
dogmatic claims about Cantos 5 and 32 through 33 of Dante's Inferno, um, because of the brief time today, cannot fully evidence my proposals. Um, that's why they're dogmatic, but please ask me later. Uh, so Canto V is the beginning or a second beginning of the Inferno's narrative. If you think about the Inferno as a series of interviews between Dante the Pilgrim and the sinners he meets in hell, then Canto V is the first canto in that series because Paolo and Francesca are the first ones whom he meets. Uh, thus, I'll roughly call Canto V the functionally first canto of the Inferno. It sets the tone for the rest. It should be therefore read closely. So uh, what is Canto V about? Well, to anticipate my thesis, um, Canto V is about lust, as everyone believes, but not about sex, except metaphorically, perhaps. Rather, Canto V is about literary lust or literary desire. It's about reading. Well, the commentaries will tell you that Canto V concerns Dante's meeting with two sinners who have committed adultery because they were overcome with lust. Then they are both murdered uh, together by the husband of Francesca, who is also the brother of Paolo. So Paolo and Francesca are the lovers. They are murdered by her husband, who is also his brother. The lover's punishment being windswept in hell, their dam damnation uh, condition. This fits their crime is the idea because being pushed around by lust is like being swept around by the wind. So here's my dogmatic statement number one. Um, the commentaries on the Inferno are not reliable. Uh, the official interpretation to which I just now alluded is not entirely wrong, but as ever, such things require further interpretation. So here's a question. What was the motivation of the two lovers? What did they actually want? Now, first, only Francesca speaks in this canto, and I remain puzzled by the motivations of Paolo, who never speaks. Uh, his mysterious silence resounds loudly. I do have some hypotheses about Paolo, but I would appreciate suggestions about what he's up to. Uh, when we come to the discussion part of this. So what does Francesca want? What does Francesca lust for? Uh, sex? Well, Francesca does lust, yes, but her lust is not for physical pleasure. Francesca pursues much grander goals. What then does she desire? Well, in addition to being functionally first, Canto V is also remarkable for another reason. It is about reading. Paolo and Francesca's fall is occasioned uh, by their reading a story together, right up until they stop reading and do something else. Uh, as uh, she says, that day we read no more, says Francesca suggestively. And I think we all know what they did next, but actually beware of that knowledge. Um, it'll become important later, the status of that knowledge. So then what art story are Paolo and Francesca reading at the critical moment of their own story? They read a beautiful poem together about a courtly love affair gone tragically wrong, the story of Guinevere and Lancelot. Of course, this poetry too involves an act of adultery like that of Francesca. And hell is so narcissistic, it's you know windows, uh, mirrors everywhere. As Francesca tells it, the reading of this famous story gets the two lovers, she and her boyfriend, Paolo, in big trouble. So the functionally first canto of the Inferno, itself a poem, involves another poem about Lancelot and Guinevere, and this poem is dangerous. When Paolo and Francesca read it, they become hell-bound sinners. So the technical term for this, for art about art, is ekphrasis. So here's a puzzle. Why is ekphrasis so important for Canto V? Uh, when great artists engage ekphrasis, pay attention. Such artists are often more concerned about art than almost anything else. Often, they use ekphrasis to make some point about art, its creation, quality, effects, or consumption. Often, ekphrasis implies a commentary about the very art one is reading, the art that contains the ekphrasis, how one should read that art, and about the intention of its artists. In this case, the ekphrasis signals Dante's interest in how the Inferno should be read, and in particular, how Canto V should be read. Well, speaking of ekphrasis and of reading, Canto V is actually chock a block, chock a block. Uh, with many highfalutin literary allusions. In addition to Guinevere and Lancelot, there are many references to beautiful hero heroes and heroines of so many tragic love stories of the past, including Semiramis, Dido, Helen, Cleopatra, Paris, Tristan, etc. Each of these characters, interestingly, becomes heroes or becomes a hero or a heroine of tragic lover opera later. Think about that opera. 
Speaking of ekphratic poetic art, in Cantor V, we find scores of examples of very high polluting uh, literary language and literary figures. Overtly literary language per se is present in Canto V much more than in other cantos. Uh, I didn't count, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. In fact, once you start to notice all this high falluting literariness becomes puzzling at best and obtrusive, perhaps even cloying at worst. Yeah, so Canto V contains much self-consciously, over the top, ridiculously high falluting poetry, bad poetry. Canto V is a parody of bad poetry. So this is a subtle point. Um, took me a long time to understand this. It's a subtle point because it's difficult to discern when poetry parodies poetry. Uh, and I wish I had time to give you some examples uh, of some of the bad poetry which in which this thing abounds. Once you ask yourself, wait, is this good poetry or is this kind of bogus poetry? Um, things change. So I'll give you one example later. I assure you, all this ecstatic super literariness, including the bad poetry cloy factor, all of this is deliberately produced for effect by Dante the poet. So dogmatically I state, Canto V is in part about poetry, especially bad poetry and its effects. So here's a puzzle. Why would Dante deliberately engage what is actually bad poetry in this canto? And what does this have to do with our original question concerning Francesca's lust? First, let me remind you of a Dantean principle. The denizens of hell all desire the good, but they have perhaps unconsciously twisted that good into something, well, twisted. The view I propose uh, is Socratic in the sense that the problem of the Hellions is not primarily their will, but rather their intellects. They aren't seeing the good correctly. Lacking insight, they're committed to and therefore desire a false or perverted vision of the good. In short, the Hellions are bad readers of goodness. They mistake tempting idols for reality. This is the infernal mind block. And uh, you can see Cantos in Purgatorio, Canto 17 and 18 for Virgil's version of this uh, doctrine. Actually, I believe that uh, mind lock, i.e. delusion about the good is hell. It's not so much that Francesca is first mind locked and is later punished for it, but rather the mind lock, the delusion is somehow both the crime and the punishment. That is my intuition about hell. So then how is Francesca mind locked? What false image of the good is the image, is the object of her lust? Now I'm gonna make a, a series of super dogmatic assertions about what Francesca does and does not desire. Remember, you can ask me later. Uh, first, Francesca's true desire has little to do with her ostensible love, Paolo, whom she never names or even addresses directly. Second, the good that Francesca desires is not physical pleasure. Francesca does not care about mere sex. She, like Dante himself, is interested in much grander things. About Dante, I don't think he cares much about sex per se. I mean, you know, the poet, qua poet. Uh, what primarily interests him is the mind of the soul. Francesca doesn't care about sex, although she does care about what sex often brings about, i.e. a kind of immortality. Um, but what Francesca wants is not physical immortality through having children, etc. So here's my central dogmatic claim. Francesca lusts for literary immortality. She desires to be immortalized in poetry as the beautiful heroine of a tragic love story. And this brings together the two puzzles. Canto V is ecstatic because it's the, about the power of bad literature to create and sustain bad mind-locking desires, including the bad desire to be immortalized badly in bad poetry. Now, immortality is good, and the desire for immortality is also good. Obviously, Dante's own Christianity is itself partially motivated by a desire for immortal life, the right kind of immortal. But Francesca lusts to become immortal like the heroines of the bad tragic love story she beats so avidly. So what is bad about this is A, it's wrongly focused immortality, and B, to achieve her self-centered goal, Francesca is willing to commit adultery and even to occasion a multiple homicide. She will kill or die for immortality. For Francesca must die for love or be killed by love. If not, uh, and we'll, we'll, we can discuss later the way she personifies love, if not, uh, then it is much more difficult for Francesca to become the beautiful tragic heroine of a deathless tragic love story like Dido or Cleopatra, etc. So it's very convenient for her to be killed by her husband. Thus, I believe that Francesca's death at the hands of her enraged husband is actually a calculated suicide. We could call it a suicide by husband. I suspect Francesca also instigates her husband to murder her lover, Paolo, his brother, and that would make it the whole enterprise of murder-suicide for the sake of fame. 
Um, I don't know if that's true about Powell because as we said, I don't understand Powell. There's much more to say about all this, but the thesis is confirmed by the fact that Francesca is so eager to meet Dante when he first calls her. And we get a whole high fluting Homeric simile about this. Um, and so this is what happens after Dante mm, the pilgrim calls them. So this is what the narrator, Dante the narrator has to say. He says, as doves called by desire with wings raised and steady come through the air borne by their will to their sweet nest. So did these issue from the troop where Dido is coming to us through the malignant air. Such force had my compassionate cry. Um, by the way, the word that is translated as desire is the Italian word easio. If you look it up, you can see that it's a purely literary word. It, it just, it shows up only in literature. Um, so this is infernally bad poetry, by the way. Um, the reason that Francesca is so desirous to talk to Dante the Pilgrim is that she hopes he will tell her story and thus make her famous. Dante himself, meanwhile, is so moved by her story that he swoons at the end of the canto. From one point of view, the swooning and high toned poetic diction, the tragic references, et cetera, it's all very impressive. But from another point of view, it's ridiculous. Uh, and so one of the things I'm interested in is how the divine comedy is comic. Uh, and you have to kind of look at it a little slant wise to see the comedy, but I think this is comic here. So mostly uh, all of this mm, high tone poetic fiction, et cetera, reflects the size and the shape of the box in which Francesca and Dante the Pilgrim are mind locked. If they had an insight, then they would see that their lusts are ridiculous and bad, and then they could walk free of hell. Ultimately, however, Francesca does get what she blessed for, sort of. For Dante does make Francesca famous. Francesca's story is indeed duly retold by Dante the narrator under the close supervision of Dante the poet. So she is the centerpiece of the functionally first canto of the world famous uh, Inferno of Dante. It's as if Dante the narrator is laying claim to be the Virgil of his own time. So Virgil is to Dido as Dante is to Francesca. But ironically, although Dante the poet does render Francesca immortal as she wishes, still, she is immortal only as the fame, thirsty, morally compromised, slightly ridiculous heroine of a contrived, cheesy, over-the-top, swoony love story filled with bad poetry. At the end, Dante the Pilgrim swoons in sympathy with Francesca, but Francesca is a bad love story that would cause only a bad reader of bad poetry, such as the sentimental pilgrim to swoon. So this is part of Dante the Pilgrim's education. Thus, the Ephrasta Canto V is a deliberate, tempting enactment of bad poetry and a swooning, swooningly bad poetic perception. And I would remark that only a master poet like Dante would so successfully offer a pastiche of bad poetry, of infernal poetry, at the beginning of his own poetic masterpiece. Canto V is designed to test our capacity to tell the difference between good and bad uh, and good and bad poetry, and it's designed to warn us about the infernal mind lock that bad poetry implies. Recall the passage at the beginning of the Paradiso where Dante explicitly warns his readers about the dangers of his own poetry. He says there, turn back if you're you're not able to handle this. It's dangerous. I've often puzzled like what's the big danger here anyway? Like when how's it okay, what is he overdoing it here? So Canto two of the Paradox uh Sorry, where Canto II of the Paradiso warns explicitly, Canto V of the Inferno of the Inferno warn, warns implicitly about the dangers of infernal poetry. For it is the bad reading of bad poetry that ruins the lives of the characters in Canto V. Mind locked and seduced by bad poetry, they lust for bad fame, like the bad tragic characters they read about, and this illusion is their hell. So one moral from closely reading Canto V, we ought to be careful in our own reading, lest we end up swooning over what is really some tawdry, low-rent love story that's been tarted up in highfalutin, bad poetic language to seem ever so beautiful and moving. And by the way, there is an opera about Paolo and Francesca. Uh, I haven't seen this opera, but I would bet, and you know, if somebody loves this opera, please let me know. I'm sure that I'm wrong about this, but I would bet that it's operatically bad, and I bet the audience is filled with swooners. More generally, close readers can see that in the Inferno, appearance is not reality. Despite seductive appearances and mind block professorial commentators, Francesca is not in hell for reasons concerning her lusty body. Francesca's problem is spiritual. She ardently desires the wrong immortality for the wrong reasons and the wrong ways. So if the foregoing is correct, then from Canto V, close readers can discern also that close reading is necessary for reading uh, the Inferno to those who have, more will be given. 
Indeed, the real work of Dante's poetry lies ever latent below the surface. I conjecture this to be true of all the cantos of the Inferno. Yeah, I'm not certain of it, but it seems like that to me. Uh, they all feature, I guess, a sharp distinction between appearance and reality. This is part of what hell is like. Hell is the place of illusion or delusion. To escape hell is to escape the various mind locks that make those delusions. All right, so having made a series of brazenly dogmatic claims about the functionally first canto of the Inferno, we'll go on to make a series of similarly dogmatic claims about the functionally final Ugolino story in cantos 32 through 33. In Canto 32, Dante meets Ugolino in hell as he, Ugolino, is gnawing away on the brain of his rival, Ruggieri. Ruggieri had previously tricked Ugolino into coming to a meal at which he, Ugolino, would be captured. Then he and he, Ugolino, and his sons are imprisoned in a high tower. Ugolino prophesies that others will be shut up in that tower. So here's a puzzle for close reading. Why does Ugolino make that prophecy? This is uh, in line 24 of Canto 33. Why does he make that prophecy? Who are those who, he says, will be shut up in the hunger tower? So we'll return to this puzzle. Meanwhile, back in Ugolino's narr narrative, narrative, food is dramatically withheld from the captives in the tower. So now Ugolino and his sons are up there starving. So much is well known to all outside the tower, but then there's a question that only those inside the tower the hunger tower can answer. What happens next inside that high tower with only one small window? To Dante the Pilgrim, Ugolino temptingly dangles the answer to this question. Of course, the Pilgrim hungers to learn the true inside story. Inquiring minds want to know. Meanwhile, we close readers are also hungry to know. It comes with a close reading territory, this hunger to know. As veteran close readers of the Inferno, we're already aware that whatever seems to be true is likely not the real story. We too thus hunger to penetrate into the hidden depths of the Ugolino story, uh, find out what really happened inside that tower, just as we previously penetrated into the hidden depths of the Francesca story to learn what she really lusted after. We're so clever, we close readers, there can be no mysteries for us, we can expose it all. And this hunger to know the hidden truth, a desire both in us and in Dante the Pilgrim, this is what Ugol the Ugolino story is really about. So I therefore dogmatically assert the functionally final canto of the Inferno is uh, about, guess what? Close reading and the hunger to know. So what is the symbolic significance of Ugolino's eating Ruggieri's brain? Well, having been fooled before, Ugolino wants never again to be fooled by what is hidden in Ruggieri's mind. Ugolino seeks transparency. He wants to know it all. In his hunger for knowledge, Ugolino is like an infernal philosopher, like some Demented Hegelian, Ugolino hungers to consume everything that is outside of himself, everything unknown to himself, but especially the brain of his antagonists. Note that the infernal metaphor for knowing or learning here is eating. Desire, desire to know is hungry. Ugolino hungers to know all, to incorporate all that is alien into himself. He wants to reduce object, mysterious unknown object to subject. He wants the annihilation of all mystery. This is a proto-Hegelian model of imperialistic philosophy. Note again that the hunger for knowledge per se is good, but mind-locked Ugolino is twisted into something bad. This perverted philosophy is Ugolino's mind-lock, his hell. For Ugolino, the mind of Ruggieri is a physical thing. Ugolino's brain, the mind equals the brain. So that's the kind of infernal philosopher we're talking about here. To know Ruggieri's mind, Ugolino eats his brain. Ugolino fantasizes about literally incorporating Ruggieri. Ugolino is thus an infernal philosopher, and that means a grotesque materialist philosopher. Furthermore, alas, we also note that apparently Ugolino consumes his own children inside that tower. This represents a similar symbolic hunger to reduce alterity to identity. This is a uh, reverse Oedipal, by the way. Uh, Ugolino wants his children to be entirely known to him. He wants them to be, he wants them to be him even physically. Finally, uh, and most interesting perhaps, Ugolino even gnaws on his own fingers. But recall, eating is knowing, so Ugolino's self-cannibalistic gesture points to a problem with self-knowledge, uh, especially from a materialist point of view. Um, Ugolino's body, his fingers, starting with the fingers, they're not his brain and they're not his mind, therefore they too are alien objects and that's why he eats them. Uh, to have self-knowledge in this materialistic scheme thus requires Ugolino to eat his own fingers, then arms, etc. Soon logic will produce the paradox 
Ugolino's teeth will be impossibly gnawing on his own teeth. Um, here's the moral of the story. If true self-knowledge is possible and knowing is like eating, then the mind cannot be physical as the mind cannot eat itself. Well, moving right along. Actually, there is a problem here. We, we do not actually see Ugolino eat his children in that tower. And we know, uh, all we know about what happened up there is what Ugolino unreliably tells us. And even Ugolino never actually explicitly says he did eat his sons. Rather, Ugolino says something elliptical. He says that after much time of being shut up in that tower, having had no food, and after his sons were already dead, and after his, quote, groping over them for a certain period, well, then he says, fasting did more grief, more than grief had done. Fasting did more than grief has done. In other words, his hunger overpowered his grief. Now, in my mind, that elliptical statement clearly implied that Ugolino indeed ate his own children. I'm as sure of it as I am that Francesca committed adultery with Paolo. Uh, this is also hinted at in a similarly elliptical statement that day we read no more. It doesn't say, and then we did it. It just said, oh, we stopped reading. And, you know, the, the morally culpable reader supplies the uh, missing what happens in the ellipses, right? Because we're bad. Um, Hippocrite lictor. Anyway, although I'm confident I know what happened in that tower, confident I know that Ugolino ate his own children, for some maddening reason, there's a scholarly controversy about it. Here's Singleton in his magisterial commentary on this elliptical passage in the Inferno. So this is the great Singleton. He says, well, some commentators have held the curious view that Dante meant to imply that the Count, in the extremity of starvation, did actually attempt to prolong his life by feeding upon the bodies of his sons as they had begged him to do while they were yet alive that hunger, quote, hunger prevailed over, quote, grief in that sense. But such a view, says Singleton, such a view of the meaning here is hardly worth a serious rebuttal. Hardly worth a serious rebuttal. So I need to confess that those lines make me angry, so angry that I literally threw my copy of Singleton's commentary across the room when I first read them. What an idiot was this Singleton to believe that he knew what happened and to be so magisterially dismissive of my interpretation, the obvious interpretation, the only interpretation about what happened in that tower. How could Ugolino not have eaten his own children? This is the absolute low po point of hell, right? So what are you gonna do there? You didn't eat your own children. Uh, if not there, then where? What else could have happened? His sons even asked him to eat them, and, or so Ugolino reports. Plus, you know, there's a long tradition of symbolic child eating going back at least as far as he see it. Why wouldn't Dante wanna get in on the child feasting action? Singleton is stupid, I thought, and the commentary goes flying. And that's when I realized that Dante had caught me. I was mind locked and Dante exposed it. Why? Because I realized that all my close reading, my penetration, my hunger to know, all that was itself also infernal. After all, what business of mine is it to know what horrible thing did or did not happen inside that tower? Why should I become emotionally invested in knowing the inner workings of this disgusting event? How is it gonna make me a better person if I penetrate the mysteries of the high tower with only one small window? I realized that as a close reader, I was to Dante as Ugolino was to Ruggieri. I was to Dante as Ugolino was to Ruggieri. In other words, I was trying to eat Dante's brain. That is disgusting. So this is Dante's pedagogy. I suddenly saw that this realization had been deliberately arranged for me by Dante the poet himself. So here's, recall our puzzle. Ugolino prophesies that others will be locked up in the hunger tower, but he doesn't say who they are. I realized then that I was locked up in the hunger tower by my own hunger, the desire to know things I shouldn't and probably couldn't know, stemming from pride in myself as a close reader of poetry. That was my mind lock and my own hell. So this is a final teaching of the inferno for me and other close readers. Just as there is infernal love and infernal poetry, so there's also infernal close reading. And so let us recognize that mind walk and thus escape the infernal tower. So watch out for that. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Michael. Um, I have, that was great. Uh, I have I have lots of questions. Um, I think maybe I have time, we have time. I have time for one or two. Are you, uh, will you entertain a question or two? Bring it. <laughs> okay. So I, I had another one in mind, and then as you came to your conclusion, I realized that um, that that this is the one I need to, to ask if I if in case I only have time for one. But I do have a Paolo and Francesca question. If we can um, we can get there, and let me uh, remind uh, folks watching this right now that um, I I have the privilege of asking the first question or two, but um, 
uh, really this whole project is designed to encourage you to join us, ask your own questions, engage us in conversation, um, talk to Michael uh, about Dante. Um, so please do uh, keep that in mind and, and plan to join us on September 9th. Um, but here's, here's, my, here's my question. In both of the, the stories from the Inferno that you gave, the Paolo and Francesca story and the Ugolino story, um, one of the really interesting things between the two, as you highlighted, was that it seems like the decisive sin is only uh, implied or um, uh, sort of perhaps pointed to in a, a way that even serious commentators of Dante could uh, could miss, right? Um, you know, and then we read no more like you. That seems clear to me you know, that that, 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 that they, what they did after reading was have sex. And in fact, having sex is what got them to where they are. So it's not just that something's left out because somehow it's indelicate. It seems like the decisive thing is left out that, that, um, that there's a way in which their, their sort of placement in that section of hell and I understand, and I actually part of my other question was on this larger sense of what they did, but um, but it it's it's tied to that act. Or maybe we want to say much more strongly, and this maybe would be leaning far more into your into your thesis, that in fact it has nothing to do with it. Um, and it isn't the decisive act. Uh, and so the fact that it's um not spoken explicitly. Um, is is not important, and a close reading will will show you that by not knowing that you actually still have what you need to understand that the Canto Five. So this this is actually kind of my question is emerging now: is do you, do you think that why do you think these things are unsaid? Um, uh, as as I I'm really interested in this idea as a test to the reader, a kind of way of of testing yourself, but I'm still trying to kind of make sense of the structure of, of that test. Um, so coming to Ugolino, just trying to, to work the parallel, as you said, why would he be at, uh, at the bottom of the Inferno? Why would he show up in 33, except that he'd um, done this thing, which is classically taboo um, among the, the worst things a human being could do, you know, as you, as you mentioned. Um, I take your point that uh, what what good does it do? What business is it of ours? What happened in that tower? Um, but yet it seems like the structure of the Inferno suggests that he must have done something extraordinarily sinful to find himself where he is. So we're being drawn into that implication. So why? I mean, did, is, it, is it the case that Ugolino belongs where he is without us jumping to what seems to me that present uh, implication, that the the kind of clear implication of the ellipsis there, and likewise the clear indication of what the ellipsis is in Canto Five. Um, do we really not need to go to that conclusion to make sense of where they are? Is the test that kind of pure that we can we can do without it, or? Um, or do we need to have some sense of what happened in those ellipses to understand why they are where they are? Okay, thank you for this uh, really terrific question. I'm grateful to you for it, and uh, I'm going to try to think my way through it. So the, I guess to take to sort of move some low hanging fruit out of the way, one thing someone might say is, "Listen, these people are talking about the worst things they ever did." So there's a little bit of modesty there. They're like, you know, like sort of, even though they're both they both are kind of boastful about it they still kind of want to figure it. so it makes a kind of psychological sense that it would be that way that they wouldn't quite bring themselves to say the thing right so i think you know some we have to give a little uh credence to that view right and that um you might be tempted to say and that's all it is but i don't think so um but so that's a place to start is just the psychology of like not wanting to say and sort of hoping that you know the reader or your interlocutor would sort of put it together and you wouldn't have to actually come right out and say it um so there's that's just for starters um you don't think that's by any means the whole story 
Um, I also think that it's, I guess what I would be inclined to, like, I think you can make a terrific study of ellipses, you know, in the Inferno, and I haven't, so um, I, I'm just kind of quasi speculating here. But in both cases, um, and I think this is true in general, I don't think Dante cares that much about what people did, right? So there are people in Purgatorio, people, you know, who are going to heaven who did terrible, terrible things. Um, and just, you know, what matters is what's in their mind. And so in a way that they actually did like, oh, you know, like something you could film, let's put it that way, uh, depending upon what sort of a filmmaker you were, that they actually did the, the deed, the factum. Um, I don't, I just don't think Dante cares that much about that. Like, I think he's much more interested in, like, if you give somebody what I was calling that mind lock, they're going to do something. Right. I mean, and that's really the and that's really where the hell is not in the like and you can imagine somebody conceivably you can imagine someone doing those exact same external actions and still going to heaven and, you know, like living happily ever after and having the good immortality. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, like things you can like I used to tell my students, like always the most important things are invisible, always. Right. So if you can film it, you know, that's nice, but you don't know what the intentions were, for example. Right. And you don't know what the mindset is that produced this. Um, and I think it's the, the sort of spiritual reality that produces the action. And I think so. That's the second thing I want to say about this is that, you know, it's just not that important, the exact details of what they did or didn't do. And this relates to another thing, which is that um, I don't think. So there's a kind of a way of understanding Dante that that it makes complete sense in which people I think is just the natural way is to think of it as like he committed this crime which is an action and therefore he is in this circle and he's being punished in this way um and he was bad and or she was bad and so therefore you know this is the story the punishment fits the crime and there's a whole kind of you know discourse around this um uh starring a word an Italian word contrapasso which means oh look at look at how the punishment fits crime um and uh, you know I have some hesitations about this because I think that it gets what I want to do is like the, the one problem with seeing the thing in that way is that it becomes very easy to be sort of you know finger pointy and say oh this person did this bad thing and therefore they deserve this other thing whereas I think you know if you look at some of the earlier like the really the, the real beginning of the inferno right he talks about how he was asleep you know he kind of sleepwalked into this so I think the discussion about guilt and responsibility and punishment and all this stuff that philosophers like to talk about I think it's very subtle and interesting in Dante and and quite really sort of even explicit uh, there's a very deep question in Dante about the meaning of punishment and crime and guilt and responsibility. Whereas you think that, so, you know, you could go down that road, but I think for me, the, really the hell that these people are living in is the hell of mistaking what the good is. Um, and, you know, after that, the actions are sort of less important. So that's number two. Um, uh, and I think you can tell that Francesca is in hell by the way she talks about herself, even if she never actually did that stuff. Um, similarly, you can tell that, you know, uh, Ugolino's in hell by the fact that when you meet him, he's gnawing on another man's brain, right? So there is something, and so we don't really need to know, you know, did he do these uh, about the facts? Although, of course, you know, if you, you know, I, I am inclined to get sort of dogmatic about this and throw books across the room. And this is the final thing I want to say about this is that we think that both of these cantos are about the mind and about reading in a way that, you know, others aren't quite as much, although all of them are. Um, and, you know, uh, of course the, you know, Ulysses Canto is big in this regard, but I, I think all of them really are about the mind and the spirit. But I think here in these two particular cases, there is a lot of work that Dante's doing about how do you read this book or how do you read any book and what is it like to read? And so this is very artfully done. Like he's gonna set you up to jump to a conclusion and then this gives you an opportunity when you realize later, wait, I was never actually told this, right? Um, and if you look, for example, we're never even told Paolo's name in this thing, right? It's, his name never comes up, et cetera. But the commentators supply it. And then it's a famous story from, you know, ripped right from the pages of some tabloid uh, in Dante's time or something or gossip or whatever it is. So in any case, I think that's like, if you get, oh, that day we read the more, like some students just don't get it. Like, and they're like, mm, so they were able we stop doing their homework and <laughs> or whatever 
was. So some people like innocent people, not bad people like ourselves don't get this and bad people like ourselves do get that. And that's, this is, I think really the big thing in Dante is that it, it is a mirror in a pedagogical sense. Like, Oh, you just got that. Oh, that means you're a bad person like me. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would say a similar thing about, I would say a similar thing about the, um, uh, hunger tower, right? So it's elliptical. He dangles something there. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure he did it, but what, like, you know, it doesn't really matter that much anyway. Um, what matters is his frame of mind, but my mind instantly goes there and then it wants to defend this because it's so smart. And, you know, uh, it's like the sort of hunger to know the hunger to know makes one make those jumps. And then you have to take a step back and go, wait, I wasn't there. How do I know what happened? Uh, this is, a, 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 you know, if Ugolino is not an unreliable narrative, there ain't none. Um, and so this is what he's saying. And even he is saying it in this artful way. And so instead of like getting obsessed on did it or didn't it, right? Did they do it or not? Did he eat them or not? I think this is a kind of a weirdly sort of materialistic mind block. And the, really the main thing is not that anyway. The main thing is not did he do it and did he was he punished because he did this exact thing. The main thing is what's going on in his mind and there and more importantly than what's going on in the mind of Dante when he encounters them uh, and what's going on in the mind of the reader uh, and you know what am I learning about myself and so I think you know Canto Five which is in the way the functionally first sets you up to be all like oh look at me I'm so clever I can distinguish deliberately bad poetry from good poetry I can distinguish. Uh, that, you know, it looks like it's less physical lust on the surface, but really it ain't. And I'm so smart and this is rewards me. And I get a little pellet from Dante when I do this. And then by the time I get to Canto 32 and 33, Dante is like, no, you don't get a pellet. It means you're, you know, you, you have to repent from this. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the feeling of reading the other two um, canticles is so much different. And there is close reading to be done, but it's much less a kind of like, you know, Columbo sort of interrogating, like find out sort of what the dirty little secret is kind of thing. So there's, uh, I hope that, I hope you feel as if I've given you th maybe three different possible ways of looking yeah. at you. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to continuing to talk to you about these things. There's uh, a lot of what you said um, was very helpful and also generated several more questions in addition to the questions I have uh, just about Canto 5. But that's uh, that's how this is supposed to work. Um, I, I thank you for um, for generating all of those questions. And at, at the end of a good core conversation, I find myself jumping back in <laughs> to, to these readings. And uh, so maybe I'll, I'll get some Dante back uh, fresh in my mind before um, before we meet uh, again. Um, let me just, uh, before I say thank you finally and, and uh, we sign off here, let me remind everyone um, that uh, we do have this series of core conversations. This is the first one. Please join us September 9th at 10 a.m. Eastern time to talk with Michael about Dante. I'll be there too to direct traffic, but uh, the, you're going to talk, uh, coming on, on to talk to Michael and each other. Um, and then we have the series of core conversations that I've already mentioned for you and that uh, is available. Uh, the information on that's available on our website. Let me mention though, that we will have uh, some live events this year. We're very excited to have a fairly full schedule of face-to-face -face events, um, including um, a ACTC European conference at uh, the University of Tilburg. Uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, those of us on this side of the ocean are definitely invited to submit papers and attend that conference. The Europeans come over to our conference here in North America um, every year, and they would love for us to uh, to come over, over there. Uh, it's a pretty interesting theme um, and theme statement, which is available on the website. It's a conference on resilience and the core. So I, I encourage you to check that out. We will have a uh, undergraduate conference at Assumption University um, in March. Uh, we'll be inviting um, members of ACTC schools, uh, faculty members at ACTC member schools to nominate undergraduates to come to, to that conference in March. So keep an eye out for that. And we will open the registration for our, um, our annual conference, which will be in Dallas this year. 
Um, yeah, so come and uh, we can hang out. We can have conversation with Michael live. Uh, we'll be in Dallas March 30th to April 2nd. Um, and the, uh, the the website will be open for submissions in the next month or so. Um, so we encourage you to, to come and, uh, and join us in Dallas in late March. Uh, but for now, uh, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. It's fun. And thank you to everyone who's watching this. And we look forward to talking to you about Dante and wherever else the conversation leads us on September 9th. See you then.